Hey. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I've been working on a secret project for the past couple months, and uh, Phil just outed me and just founded it. So good job, Phil. You found, you found me. Anyways, so what I've been working on is I have um, been writing some, I guess what's probably best described as sound drivers or sound code for a DOS game. And uh, because that sounds like fun. So that's something I've been toying with for the past uh, couple months between uh, work and uh, dying of allergies. Uh, and it's been pretty cool. And I've been waiting to show it off. It's, it's not ready for showtime, but... Uh, Whatever. Let's 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 show some of the cool stuff so that I can, I can answer Phil's question. All right. So let's flip this around. Okay. Here's the wide view. Um, what we got here is we have an old school Lenovo laptop, like real old school. Like it's so actually it's so old school. It's actually not Lenovo. It's an IBM, which is quite uh, quite classy. Uh, this laptop I I recently picked up uh, because it has it's old enough that it has drivers for the Sound Blaster 16 clone that's built into it. DOS drivers, I should say. That's been the, the biggest difficulty in uh, in DOS testing, has been acquiring uh, like parts and stuff with drivers old enough that still run. And this is one such machine. I just, at this moment, I don't currently have the, uh, the Sound Blaster drivers set up correctly, but that is beside the point. So I got this DOS machine. Um, it takes floppy drives and even a CD-ROM. It also has a USB port, which we'll get to later. Um, and over here is a series of interesting toys. So first of all, we got, you know, let's talk about the big one first. This right here is a Roland Sound Canvas. So if you've played, uh, you know, DOS games back in the day, you might remember seeing something about Roland Sound Canvas or uh, uh, that kind of thing uh, inside the, the options for sound. And that's what this is. This is a box that takes MIDI inputs. I'm starting to put you upside down. Ah! Okay, let me find the MIDI ports. Yeah, we got MIDI ports back there. They take raw, hopefully that didn't flip, they take raw MIDI inputs and uh, play sounds. So this box by itself is not enough to, uh, to, it's not actually a sound card, it just is a general MIDI compatible interface. So as long as general MIDI and messages get sent to it, it will play it. Um, uh, I don't currently have a device that can plug into a DOS machine and play sounds from this, but uh, on Windows, for example, I can hook up a, uh, uh, a fake driver uh, and hook this device up to a USB device with MIDI outputs and have DOSBox simulate the, the correct setup and like actually play sounds through this external box. I'm not gonna demo that. I've demoed that in a different video elsewhere. Um, so this is cool. This is the Roland Sound Canvas and that's fun. Uh, in the same vein, we have this little guy here, which is a, as you can tell, it's a parallel port. It is a parallel port card, sound card, that actually emulates what this guy here does. And it's all that, that little tiny chip there in the middle. That, that is the secret right there. There's a whole bunch, there's a whole sound bank of like every sound that this guy has on here on this tiny little chip. So basically you plug this card into the back of your computer, plug in a uh, power, which it comes in over via USB, and then uh, headphone or headphone jack out or speaker out. And this little doodad will simulate this dude here. Uh, now you still have to run a driver that, uh, that pretends to be the MPU 401, which is uh, the hardware that actually talks to these devices. But still, you know, it's, it, there's, that's, that's a thing that you could run and it's pretty great. Um, other fun things, we have this guy here, this is CVX4, or Kovacs4, which uh, emulates something called the Kovacs sound thing. That is actually the name. Um, and what this does is it basically provides an 8-bit um, uh, audio out, which is pretty cool. Uh, but this device, as you can see, it has no headphone jack, or sorry, no uh, USB jack on it. Uh, which means it does not have a built-in amplifier. So uh, the sound comes out at line level, which is not hearable on headphones. So I have this little dude out here I got from China, like 10 bucks, and uh, you plug that into there, and this is a little amplifier. It's got an internal battery, so you charge it here, and then you plug it into that, and you can this will amplify things to a level that you can actually hear it through headphones, which is really great. And then over here, we have the OPL LPT kit. Uh, and kit is the magic word. As you can see here, there's nothing populated on this circuit board. In fact, everything that's in there right now is just being held in by uh, uh, friction, I suppose. The little legs and stuff are holding them in. Basically, I have what this this guy here, which is, um, I guess, a part of kits. There's, there's the actual LPT or L uh, OLP chip in there that does the stuff. But long story short, uh, the OPL, 
series of chips are the sound chips that you found in like the AdLib cards, the Sound Blaster 16, the Sound Blaster, pretty much the entire Sound Blaster family, up until a point. Let's, here's a, here's a Sound Blaster 16, uh, and hopefully that zooms right. But you can see the Creative OPL chip there, which is uh, uh, a Yamaha chip, but you know, Creative with their name on it. Uh, up until a certain point, you got these authentic uh, sound cards with OPL chips on it. Eventually, they switched to emulation, where they emulated the, the sound uh, generators, which doesn't sound as good, which is kind of why, um, I don't know, sounds started sounding terrible later. <laughs> Whatever, not important. But as we can see here, we have the, the this guy here. And this is a kit I still have to build. And what it would do is I could, just like this guy here, plug it into the back of the computer, power it via the, the socket there, and then do audio out, and it would simulate basically simulate an AdLib card. Uh, that's what the o OPL2 is. Uh, it's like the earlier version of the OPL sound chip. And what that actually means is the, the OPL chips, uh, if you're familiar with, if you're not already familiar with like the DOS, like basically it's gonna sound like DOS game audio, you know, before we had sampled audio. That's what these basically do, although there is tricks for sampled audio. Um, but it's, it's kind of also a similar sound to like the, the Sega Genesis and a lot of arcade games. Uh, they did use different chips than the OPL2 uh, chips that uh, these guys use, but in general you get the same kind of FM synthesis sound. And uh, it's very distinctive and very interesting and very cool. Um, me personally, I never owned a proper... Actually, I did own a proper Soundmaster 16, so I may have experienced the, the true sound of the uh, OPL, but I didn't fully grasp what it meant way back in the day. But now I do, and so on and so forth. What's kind of interesting is the whole ad lib thing. Okay, I'm just going on a super rant. I apologize. Um, the, the OPL2, or the ad lib card, um, is compatible with the Sound Blaster 16, uh, only because they monitor the same uh, addresses as the, as the old uh, OPL2 uh, ad lib cards. So you might notice that if you select ad lib audio with the Sound Blaster 16 on an old DOS machine, it actually worked properly, which is because it's, it's monitoring two address spaces. It's monitoring one address space for uh, stereo output, and then one mon monitoring one address space for mono output, which is the old ad lib card. My gosh, this is going on. Anyways, the whole point of this, I have been playing with DOS audio and it's been fun. So we'll switch over here to this computer setup here. Uh, this is a more modern laptop. We have a floppy drive here because we got to get files over to that computer somehow. And um, I've been, again, running sound drivers for a variety of sound devices. Um, the uh, the AdLib, I don't have that code working yet, but I have PC speaker, I have Tandy, 1000 and I have oh gosh the Roland audio working so I'm just gonna quickly demonstrate uh, the what I what my test stuff sounds like so I have on Linux running a uh, a virtual MPU 401 slash virtual um, uh, Roland sound canvas style audio interface here so that's what this window is there this is the this was a virtualization of the MIDI audio output stuff and of course this is my actual window for doing things I'm just gonna run my program and we're gonna hear a tone and there it is. That's, that's, when you hear audio, that is a success in audio programming. That is a big deal. So yeah, there's DOSBox, it ran my program, and at the moment I'm testing out the Roland driver, which, as you heard there, there was a piano sound. Not too impressive, but whatever. No big deal. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna grab the floppy drive. I've already copied the files that I need over to the floppy drive. Pump this in there. And we're gonna do a bunch of little demonstrations. I'm going to prop this up here. I don't have a great angle, but I need to type stuff. So, first of all, I put the floppy drive in. I'm going to go to the uh, floppy drive. So, A colon and CD ASM test, which is where I copy my stuff. Um, and I'm going to run this program called Audio. And this is going to be a PC speaker test. So, let's just do that. This is some older code. Uh, before I had proper synchronizing with the uh, internal clocks. So as you can hear, it's a bit erratic. It does not really sound like music. That's pretty fun. So let's get a little more crazy. Uh, what we're going to do now um, is we're going to take this guy here, the, uh, the SP2, and we're going to hook this up. And the way we do that, we first, of course, have to get some power. So I've got this USB cable pre-plugged in. So there we go. We've got some power in there. The light's on. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a set of speakers that are going to work with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this into, plug my headphones into this, and we're just going to kind of hope for the best. OK. 
Okay, hopefully. Okay, so just to show it, we have everything plugged in there. So that's going to come with these headphones. And let me just type some more. Uh, we want to run ASM audio. Okay, sorry about the cut. I uh, made a mistake and I had to redo this part. So the, what's going on right now is I need to start a the driver for the virtual MPU 401 interface. And I have a batch file set up called Roland, which will run this S2P software, as you see there, on the MPU port 330 and output to LPT1. That's what it's doing, it's pretty fancy. So we have to do that. Uh, if I don't do that, the audio output is not gonna work. So let me put you down for a sec. Now let me go back to the floppy drive. CD ASM test. All right. And ASM audio. AUDIO is the program I'm going to run. So here we are here. Uh, it's, and it's running off the floppy drive because yellow. Um, and what I'm going to do, um, again, we're still plugged in here, is I'm going to put this near the headphones. Unfortunately, I don't have a set of speakers. So I'm just hoping that this is loud enough that you can hear something. You might not. So I apologize if you hear nothing, but what you should hear is the piano tone, just as we heard over there on the other laptop. Uh, so let's give this a go. If this works, great. If not, I'll just apologize. And uh, let's go. Let's go. And enter. I heard it. It was super quiet. But there we go. That's basically basically what I'm I'm doing here. Okay. So to finalize, to finally get to Phil's question. Um, Let's get a little crazier. So what's going on here is my ASM test program is a program written in DOS's or yeah DOS's real mode or Intel processors real mode, and um, in real mode there is apparently a trick that lets them uh, that lets you monitor or or do something to pretend to be something like a, a, a different port on a different address. So when we saw during the setup back back in the the Roland program a few lines ago. Uh, this driver mapped the LPT port, or rather uh, an I.O. port on 330 uh, to the LPT port. Normally, like in protect mode, which is the standard mode that Windows runs in and like every modern operating system runs in, uh, you can't do that. You, you can't um, uh, do the trick that they're doing to simulate things mapped on the address space. Um, you need to write a proper actual driver and hook into it a different way. Um, so, the point of that, uh, games written in real mode uh, can be correctly uh, faked by these devices, these LPT uh, devices. Like, these map to an address which is not actually, uh, well, well, these map to the LPT port. You plug one of these things here, they are physically connected to the LPT port, so the printer port on the back of the PC. So, in the case of the, uh, the OPL2 and the 3, uh, you will not be able to, unless you're running in DOS real mode or the real mode of whatever the CPU is on your computer, so probably not a Mac, um, you will not be able to map the addresses correctly for these devices. Um, which basically is another way of saying that these are not going to work. Um, they're not going to, unfortunately, they're not going to work on your machine, uh, on, your, on, on, your, on a machine, unless you're, you can run, you're running programs that are written in DOS real mode. Uh, protect mode, you know, more, more modern games that use like the memory managers and stuff like that. Um, it's not that they can't use these devices, but they need to be patched to send their data to a different address. So the uh, there's usually a patching tool associated with uh, these devices um, that says that goes that goes through the programs and looks for any outs or uh, in like any writes or reads. Uh, to the specific address they're expecting, like the parallel port address and that kind of thing, and just patches in code to fix it. It's it's not an elegant solution. You know, it mess, technically messes up your executables, but technically it, there's a way. It is possible to, you know, to 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 use these with more modern devices. Um, but for the most part, they are designed to be used with uh, DOS machines and on games that run in real mode. But like I said, they can run, they can work for other things, but either they need to be written specifically for them, which is not the case most of the time, or patched to send their data to a different address because the LPT port is not the same address as many other things. Otherwise, you would have caused lots of issues back in the day. People would be like, yeah, you know, I can't, I can't play sound and print at the same time. That'd be weird. So that's not a thing.
and the floppy drives come back to life. So, yeah. Oh yeah, and one last thing here. This is the one rare case where this is the 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 CVX um, is actually a device that was designed to run on the Parallel Four. This is kind of why where all these things came from. Is this is a replica of uh, the the Kovac sound thing, and um, uh, folks realized that hey, there's eight address lines, actually more than that, uh, available to you on uh, the Parallel Port interface. So they're like, okay, I wonder if we can make a sound card that works on the Parallel Port interface that does the, the LPL2 or the uh, other things, MIDI and so on and so forth. And uh, that has turned into a neat thing that you find on the DOSBox forums. These people going crazy making these uh, Parallel Port devices and uh, I'm playing Pokemon with them and collecting what I can because they're pretty neat. Anyways, this is super long. I've broken all the laws. And uh, I'm just going to stop here. Bye-bye.